Hi, you are watching. This story follows a man who gets transported into a game he was playing, where he is reincarnated into a god named Nebula, and he has to battle 27 other gods to become the sole ruler of the planet and reshape it according to their vision. Part of their challenge is to find and influence a suitable tribe. And luckily for Nebula, he found an extraordinary lizardman named Rakrak, who had been exposed to too many things ever since he was young to turn down an adventure. Rakrak had lost both his parents when he was a child, so he had to grow up without anyone's help, and he had also fought a saber-toothed tiger to protect his tribe at the time when they had gotten kicked out into the wilderness. This caught Nebula's eyes, and so Nebula was convinced that Rakrak had the qualities to be a tribal chief, which also led to Rakrak becoming a high priest that acted on behalf of God's wills. And not too long ago, with the help of God, Rakrak defeated the violent lizardman tribal chief Boer, and flipped Boer's drake with one hand, and also defeated an ancient Coleoptera when they crossed the wilderness once again. After that, he saw through the deceits of the frogmen tribe that he met for the first time in his life, and witnessed the guardian he believed in cut the inferior fiend the frogmen worshipped into pieces. These experiences filled Rakrak's life with thrill and adventure. As a result, he no longer viewed new adventures as perilous, but rather as opportunities for transformative change. This mindset led him to eagerly investigate a mysterious cave rumored to have a hidden entrance to an unexplored territory. Now on to the next part. The inside of the ancient ruin was a shockingly large empty space. It was roughly hundreds of meters in diameter, and there was green luminous moss here and there, which made it possible to see the overall size of the clearing. In the center of the empty space were arch stone bridges that were around tens of meters tall, and they were placed in a zigzag pattern that led downward. And seeing that there is no other way around, they will have to go on that path where the stones are laid, which led Rakrak to think that it would be nice if they could jump down at once, as it was such a time-consuming journey, since the stairs seemed to be endless after all. With this, Rakrak stood at the edge and think hard for an easier way to descend, but nothing comes into mind. So Jaol then inquired if he is going to pray to their god, to which Rakrak firmly responded that he wouldn't, as he didn't want to trouble their god with such matters. He believed that with their combined presence, they could more easily devise a solution. With this determination, they gathered to brainstorm a plan. They initially considered the idea of weaving long vines into ropes was the most reasonable solution. But considering the time it would take, they decided it would be better to go down the bridge instead. Still, they spent a few more minutes trying to think of something else. But as no great ideas came to them, Rakrak, who valued efficiency in decision-making, ended the meeting. And so they moved on to the next task, and that is to begin descending the bridges with their strong lizardman legs. However, Difficulties emerged not long after they got onto the bridges. Several pairs of glowing eyes were fixed on them, as if these monsters were looking at them like a snack, which intrigued the crew on what danger it might be. And as the eyes drew closer, they revealed their source to be a group of rats, notably large ones at that. But Owen, who had lived in the area for a long time, wasn't a stranger to these creatures, and so he informed everyone on what it's supposed to be, describing it as a nutria, and they may have eaten it a few times before. And with this, they remembered exactly what it was, so now they don't have to wonder if it was a threat. But this one looks a lot bigger than the ones they ate, so there's still a mystery within these creatures. Because an average nutria was about 60 centimeters long and weighed around 10 kilograms, but the nutria Rakrak was looking at seemed to be about a meter long, which meant it would weigh tens of kilograms. Additionally, there was something else that piqued Rakrak's attention. Now he gets why he didn't think of nutrias when he first saw these creatures. And that is because nutrias don't travel in groups, or charge at people while baring their front teeth like that. So there is that possibility that these aren't the nutrias they knew of. With this, Rakrak decided to just call them rat monsters. It was a simple yet fitting name. Because in Rakrak's opinion, normal animals wouldn't get hostile towards people for no reason. In fact, they would usually run away. But monsters on the other hand ran towards people as if they had a purpose. They might be the ones protecting this place. Or maybe they're just rats. But regardless of their nature, the safety of his group was paramount. Therefore, he signaled to everyone to ready their weapons, preparing for any potential threat these creatures might pose. And without even a moment's breath, the rat monsters lunged toward Rakrak and the others, but it quickly came to an end. There was around 20 rat monsters, which was quite a lot, but Rakrak and his warriors were veterans. While the bridge was quite narrow for all seven lizard men to stand on at once, the rat monsters charging at them ended up skewered by the warriors' spears. After that, Rakrak questioned whether the rats they found could be eaten, which Jaol believed there was no apparent reason why they couldn't be eaten. But she was curious about Rakrak's tendency to classify everything as either edible or inedible. And Rakrak quickly justified his approach, 
stating that determining what is edible is a matter of utmost importance. Jeol agreed that his perspective wasn't wrong, but she proposed an alternative viewpoint. She suggested they could also consider whether the rats could be domesticated and raised similarly to the water buffaloes. This immediately intrigued Rakrak, as expected of his wife, but their journey on this unknown area had just begun, so they will have to put that question for later. So they decided to just remove the organs first in order to easily carry the rats and move along. And while they quickly took the organs out, Owen curiously asked Rakrak and Jaol on what do they mean by raising these rats. And Rakrak was about to answer when he realized he didn't know what it meant himself, as the water buffaloes were raised for food, but that wasn't the case with the drake Manun. They weren't going to eat Manun, so he contemplated the concept of raising animals as akin to having slaves. But slaves were dissatisfied with their status, while things that were raised seemed somewhat satisfied. Slaves would also receive backlash for doing as they wished so they had to suppress those feelings. But that didn't seem to apply to things that were raised. And with this, he was conflicted on what to say. And so he just answered Owen that he's not sure. But still his intelligent wife might have one. So Rakrak looked at Jowl expecting her to answer instead. But Jowl also seemed troubled by the question. And so, Jail also gave up on giving a proper answer. And just explained to Owen that it hasn't been long since they've raised something. So they don't know much about it. They're currently raising water buffaloes in Manun. They gain meat from the buffaloes and strength from Manun. And in exchange, they find plants for the buffaloes and give Manun food. They wish for these relationships to last long. This is the only answer she can give him about what it means to raise something. And Owen thought that was a good enough answer, and so he decided to share to them what he had in mind, and that it might be possible to raise fishes. But Rakrak being his primitive ass, just think it would be impossible, since he thinks fish just come and go. But this wasn't Rakrak's fault. Because in the swamps and ponds Rakrak used to live around, the fish would gradually decrease as they got eaten and eventually disappeared. However, Owen, who used to live with the aquatic frogmen, knew that wasn't the case in bigger ponds, and so Owen could enlighten Rakrak that fish also lay eggs and give birth to young. This was proven by him to be true, as the frogmen would warn them against catching fish when it was breeding season. And with this, Rakrak was extra intrigued, so he immediately asked Owen how could they raise these said fish. And so Owen did just that, explaining to him that there are fish that grow big, which are easier to catch and eat, but they are also easily eaten by other fish when they are young. So it would be nice if they just stack rocks or wood to make a dike to prevent the younger fish from getting eaten, which Rakrak thought it would be difficult to do such a thing in a huge and deep lake. But he didn't say it out loud as he considered it a unique and good idea regardless of it being difficult in reality. And he is thinking of dividing the clan into two, so it'll be cruel to those who have to leave and also to those who have to stay through the winter. So it would be nice to find a way to do what Owen had just suggested. But then all of a sudden, one of the warriors handling a rat monster screamed, and Rakrak quickly turned around and approached the warrior and looked at the warrior closely. The warrior held his hand in pain, one of his fingers smelled slightly burnt, but it doesn't seem like he got bitten though. So Rakrak asked the warrior what happened, to which the warrior explained that all he did was touch the rat, and he felt pain. This instantly piqued Rakrak's interest, and so he went ahead and reached toward the rat monster. And as his finger came close to the rat, a bright spark suddenly climbs up to Rakrak's hand. But he wasn't a stranger to this kind of thing, as Rakrak knew the concept of static electricity from when he touched fur leather in winter. But this was too painful to be compared to that. And looking at him in pain, his wife Jowl immediately went to him with concern in her eyes as this was also a shock to her, as she doesn't have a clue on what is going on. And only Nebula who was watching everything unfold from behind, realized what it was. The Nutria was possessed by the demonic energy of the ruin that he hoped it would not be. And this was because divinity wasn't the only source of power in the lost world. For example, the last time Nebula had won the game on Earth, he used nuclear weapons, which was technology rather than divinity. Divinity and science would grow directly proportional to each other until the Middle Ages. And in modern times, they became negatively correlated. When people become faithful to their gods, they tend to distort science. On the other hand, when people become proficient with scientific technology and knowledge, they believe in God less. This was because science could do what the gods could do. But this decrease in belief was still less than in the real world Earth. There's no way to really know if gods exist on Earth. But gods are real in the lost world. And in the lost world, alongside divinity and science was magic. Magic was also negatively correlated with divinity, but it was different from science in that the negative correlation between magic and divinity existed from the very start. This is because magic is its own force. Anyone or anything that used powerful magic in ancient times was unstoppable. Those who had magic would be perceived as a god, 
and thus they wouldn't believe in a god. Magical powers naturally began to weaken and fall during modern times as science developed. But not every game progresses until modern times, and he had also secured quite a few wins with magic. Therefore, he knows too well that it was important for players of the Lost World to not only utilize divinity, but also balance science and magic well. Nebula had a good understanding of these rules, and always thought of using magic if necessary. But he didn't think he would obtain demonic magic this quickly. And among the many kinds of ancient ruins were the demonic ruins, which were considered an ultimate dungeon to obtain demonic magic. Simply put, acquiring demonic magic would grant the individual the ability to learn magic. Additionally, the effect not only applies to the individual making the achievement, but also to a few generations of their close kins, especially if it's a clan society like Rakrak's clan. All members of the clan may obtain demonic magic. That was the dangerous part. Obtaining demonic magic did not mean one would become a wizard right away. In order to use magic, spells needed to be learned, and these types of spells required research on ancient ruins, all kinds of ancient knowledge, and magic. However, those who had demonic magic were powerful just by having it. They could make small flames, make objects shine, or even make sparks fly. And this ancient ruin will give electrical demonic magic, as it was described in the system window Nebula was looking at. Electricity is always useful. It's on the better side of demonic magic. But the problem was that if demonic magic was obtained, there would be penalties in obtaining faith points. Rakrak was likely to be the one to conquer the ancient ruin, so there was no question that Rakrak would receive the demonic magic. In addition to that, it was possible that the 350 lizardmen related to Rakrak within his clan would also receive the demonic magic, and three out of the 350 would get it for sure. And they'll just think it's some kind of mysterious power. It'll even seem fancy since it's electrical demonic magic. However, Nebula knew what would happen afterwards. Making use of the magical ruins was a common mistake among the beginners of the Lost World. Beginners would become obsessed with the fact that they could obtain magic and lead their tribes to demonic ruins just to make them obtain demonic magic. They would also then focus their resources on those who had the demonic magic and increase their XP. The cultivated individuals would pass on their demonic magic to their descendants, and the demonic magic would become stronger and stronger over the generations, until finally, a wizard emerged. A wizard is one of the best classes from the beginning to the middle stages of the game. Wizards had strong powers that no individual could handle. The stronger they became, the greater the number of enemies they could deal with at once, which would lead to them gaining the authority to create aristocracy. Above all, because the source of the wizard's powers were magic rather than a god-given gift, they would not rely on a god. And in the Lost World, demonic magic stemmed from an ancient evil called Red Herring. That's why divinity and demonic magic come into conflict. Once wizards became that powerful, even the players would not be able to do anything to control them. Therefore, the players would invest in witch hunting or taboo to decrease the influence of demonic magic as a result. Still, it is possible to control the power somehow, but in the process, too much time and resources would be wasted. Such power might be a perk in the beginning, but that all becomes meaningless if resources are wasted on unnecessary things by the middle of the game. And a player such as Nebula would be able to balance magic well, allowing him to apply it to his build with no other problems. But it was tiring to do so, and determining whether to increase or decrease unnecessary variables was also an important task in the game. According to the statistical side of things, Demonic magic did have a lower win rate due to beginners getting overthrown by wizards, but it was still on the higher side of things when compared to pure divinity or deity demon blend. But he does aim to play with more variability, so he was contemplating if he should warn Rakrak that the demonic ruin will start to show its true colors and try to tempt them. And with Rakrak's personality, he would go to the ends of the ancient ruin if he doesn't warn him. And so Nebula agonized whether to warn Rakrak, but then decided not to. This was because once he checked Rakrak's stats again, he discovered a unique ability that hadn't been there until recently. It was likely to have appeared as Rakrak defeated Shunin and Aloy's frogmen. With this, Nebula was convinced that it might be fine to just leave it to Rakrak, as he believes that Rakrak will get the best outcome, since there is a way to acquire both divinity and demonic magic without getting penalties after all. And so Nebula just waited and see what will happen. Meanwhile, back to Rakrak's side of things, amid the sharp pain that Rakrak was experiencing, Rakrak suddenly heard a voice speak to him asking him if he wants this kind of power, which made Rakrak looked around, but saw nothing unordinary. So his attention went to Jaol, who was frantically asking if he was okay, to which Rakrak replied that he was, but seeing what happened to him, they should make sure to kill these rat monsters. So those who know how to shoot arrows, he asked them to ready their bows, and those who are injured should watch the rear. But as he was instructing them, Rakrak then heard the voice again, 
asking him again if he was interested in the power displayed. Rackrack only moved his eyes this time and saw a wide, transparent creature crackling with blue sparks hovering in the air. Its outer appearance was that of a stingray, but Rockrock, who had never seen a stingray before, didn't know what it was, and as he was wondering what to say to it, the electric stingray then told Rockrack that it can hear him even if he speaks with his mind. This fascinated Rockrack, so he did just that, promptly asking the stingray what it was, to which it confidently responded that he is the spirit that protects this ruin, and he is only visible to those with strong powers. But Rockrack thought that the stingray said was a lie, but as he thought of this, he realized this thought wasn't communicated to the spirit. Consequently, he realized that shallow thoughts are communicated, but deeper thoughts aren't. So if the stingray really is a spirit that can distinguish those with strong powers, he can try to read this thought too. But as he expected, the electric stingray wasn't able to read this thought. With this in mind, Rakrak was more confident in conversing with this unknown entity. So he then asked the stingray, what power is it talking about? Which the stingray proudly responded that he is talking about electricity. The power to burn other beings and create light, sun like light and fire like heat, and it can give him that power. And Rockrack nodded in a subtle way that would not seem strange to the others that were with him, and responded that he will gladly accept it if it gives it to him. But the electric stingray hesitated, revealing that there was one more condition Rockrack had to meet before receiving the promised power. This revelation caused Rockrack to frown. As expected, this stingray was a scammer. It is not here to give but to trade. And so, so with a cold tone in his thoughts, Rackrack schooled the Stingray that if it was really initiating a trade in the first place, it has to state the conditions first, and it needs to make sure to convey what it is giving him and what it is that it wants from him. But because of what it just did, Rackrack expressed that he was disappointed and felt a lack of trust and straightforwardness in their dealings, so he might not be willing to accept his offer anymore. Still, the Stingray tried to convince Rackrack that meeting the condition would be easy for his strength, but Rackrack had enough of its bullshit. So he looked at the stingray with the most devious side eye and command it to not lie no more. And he doubles down with a warning that if he felt even an ounce of lie on the words it was about to say, he would just go back right now and block the entrance to this cave that seemed to have been blocked for no apparent reason. Then he could order his warriors to prevent anyone from entering this cave and warn all the descendants of his tribe to never enter. So if there is really something it wants from him, it should know its place and show the appropriate attitude. And with this, the electric stingray was clearly in a state of panic. And this was such a turn of events, because in Nebula's knowledge, the intelligence of spirits wasn't that high. However, it wasn't easy for individuals who entered a demonic ruin to resist the temptation of the spirits. As expected, this was Rockrack's new ability in play, as he could now detect bullshit even from miles away, and this skill proved advantageous in negotiations, allowing him to gain the upper hand by identifying and leveraging any untruths or exaggerations presented by others. With Rakrak's threats loud and clear, the Stingray bowed its head and apologized. In response, Rakrak told the Stingray there was no need for apologies, just to remember this lesson for the future. With this, the electric Stingray flew closer to Rakrak, but its fluttering seemed less powerful than before, and then told Rakrak the truth that it is actually sealed within this ruin. It can fly freely within this space, but is unable to leave. It wishes to be freed from this restraint, offering the power of electricity to whoever could liberate it. And Rakrak, understanding the situation, promptly inquired about what needed to be done for its release, to which the electric stingray explained that it was quite straightforward, actually. If he goes down there and kill the one guarding its seal, it will become free, and so it can give him the power. This caught the interest of Rakrak, so he followed up asking if that means he would be able to do the zap thing that the rat monster did, to which the electric stingray enthusiastically confirmed. However, it clarified that he couldn't suddenly gain what the rats could do, as he still need to train the power by continuously using it. And then it becomes stronger. And the power it has is very strong, so it won't only go to him. Other than himself, a few others within his clan will get the power too. And its power can be passed down to his descendants. The progress and power he has made won't be directly passed down, but should his descendants continue to train their power like he does, some of those who share his blood may become stronger than him. This instantly amazed Rakrak. This prompted for Rakrak to willfully express his true thoughts, and asked about the elephant in the room, asking the stingray the exact reason it is trapped here. But just like before it hesitated and stuttered as it answered Rockrack's question, explaining to him that it was because its power is too strong. People stay away from dangerous things like poison or monsters, and if they can't stay away from it, they trap it and put it away. With this, Rockrack's face hardened, and pointed out that it just admitted that its whole being is dangerous. This only gave Rockrack more of a reason to keep it contained, but he knew this wasn't the case. 
as he felt that this stingray is just stupid, so it just made an error while it actually attempted to hide something again. Or the harm is greater than the benefits of having that power, and the stingray was about to defend his case and try to lie its way out of the situation. But it remembered what Rakrak had just said, and so it immediately stopped itself from saying anything rash, and seeing that the electric stingray be mindful and respected his wishes, Rakrak decided to release the tension within them by admitting to the stingray that he still wants to have that power. So they should just start the deal from the top and called the stingray zap. But this only confused it, so Rakrak clarified to it that he decided that will be its name from now on. To which the stingray tried to correct Rakrak that it is not named zap though. In response, Rakrak explained that this was the start of his deal, with him choosing its name, as it tried to trick him. So the conditions have to be more favorable to him. Zap became sullen, and just responded with a soft okay. And it then inquired about his other conditions, which Rakrak answered as though it was self-evident, requesting Zap to clarify why it is considered dangerous. As Rakrak held the belief that if Zap truly possessed power worthy of a deal, there would be no need to conceal its dangerous aspects. Conversely, if there were reasons to hide its perilous nature, then it wouldn't be worth entering into a deal for. Zap hovered in the air, think for a little bit, and understood Rakrak's reasoning. So it then confirmed to Rakrak that its own power is worth taking a risk for. This is what Rakrak had wanted, so he asks what kind of risk it was talking about, prompting Zap to explain further, stating that it originated from an ancient evil, the ones who ruled over this world a long, long time ago. But it was so long ago that their existence was forgotten, and even the gods don't remember them either. Because of it, itself also can't recall its origin. One day it just found itself trapped here. And Rakrak understood Zap's feelings quite well, as he also grew up as an orphan. So he tells Zap that there's no need to know who it were born to be. What's more important is deciding what it'll do about the days ahead of it. Zap was a bit thrown off that it got comforted by Rakrak's words, but soon continued. Zap explains that a power of unknown origin is intoxicating to people, because the source is unknown. This allows one to believe that the power belongs to them, when in reality, they just happen to get it by chance. Once they start using such a power, they start to believe they deserve it. And once they start to think that way, they look down on the ones without power. Rakrak found it a bit difficult to understand, but nodded remembering Boer's and Shunin's situations. And so it seems like the demonic magic also makes people become like that, which Zap confirmed, as its power spreads indiscriminately. Consequently, Rockrack tried to predict what would happen if he obtained this power. As this electrical demonic power seems different from something a god would give, god's power is only given to those god chose and at god's discretion. On the other hand, if someone is given a power like this without being deserving of it, others would become jealous and envious. And if that power grows greater and greater, there would be people who scorn God. And Rakrak then understood the reason why Zap was dangerous. This lead him to ask Zap why should he take such a risk to have its power. Which it immediately responded that it's because its power is strong. Still it's also destructive. And as Rakrak was heavily thinking of what to do, Zap then demonstrated his power. With this, Rakrak immediately thought he had seen this kind of light from somewhere. And eventually realized what it was. It was like thunder and lightning. Rakrak assumed that the strength of the power determined the intensity of the light it produced. It could be just a small spark at first, but once the power grew and became stronger, it could become thunder and lightning. Rakrak also understood that it would be advantageous in battle if he could produce electricity from his body like the monster rats did. And so Rakrak admitted to Zap that it's indeed an appealing power, which made Zap delighted, promptly asking Rakrak if he made up his mind and set it free, to which Rakrak confirmed, but before that he has a condition that the stingray should fulfill. This intrigued Zap, so it flew towards Rakrak as if it expected Rakrak to say so and continued to talk, as it assumed that Rakrak wants to have the power for himself, which it won't judge as it was understandable for an individual to monopolize such power, but the process will probably be difficult, but it's possible. There are a few things he will need though. In order for one person to have its power, a ritual of the same level as the magic will need to be prepared. However, before Zap could continue further, Rockrack shook his head to convey that what it assumed was incorrect. He doesn't have any intention of keeping the power only to himself. Zap was taken aback and somewhat puzzled by Rockrack's line of reasoning, leading it to request further clarification. Rakrak highlighted that Zap had initially mentioned the power of electric demonic magic was distributed indiscriminately, but also noted the possibility of concentrating this power in one individual through a ritual. Rakrak reasoned that if both statements were true, it might also be feasible to selectively distribute this power to specific chosen individuals, rather than indiscriminately. Zap still appearing puzzled, conceded that it hadn't experimented with this approach but believed it could be possible. A minor ritual might suffice. Although Zap was uncertain why Rakrak would want to do this, 
Zap reasoned that unless Rakrak monopolized all the power for himself, the outcome would essentially be akin to leaving it to chance. Rakrak, however, disagreed, asserting that the situation would indeed be different. If the power were bestowed only upon certain individuals, it would appear as though it was a deliberate choice made by a god. In other words, the power would no longer seem like an ambiguous force from an ancient evil with no identifiable origin, but would instead be recognized as a power with a clear source and purpose. But Zap just then pointed out that it's not God's choice though. This power isn't granted by a god. But Rakrak just slightly smiled and told Zap that's not the important part. If people think it's God's gift, then it will be from that point on. What difference does that make? The chosen ones will think that God has given them the powers and their faith and devotion will reach God. And Zap tried to argue against Rakrak, but couldn't think of anything to say. Because what Rakrak was saying was also true of the system of the lost world. If those who had demonic magic believed it was given to them by chance, there would be penalties in gaining faith points. On the contrary, however, if those who had demonic magic mistook it as a power given to them by a god, it would actually result in more faith points. And seeing that Zap was on the same page as him, Rakrak went ahead and told his second condition, surprising Zap as there were more. And so Zap immediately pointed to Rakrak that if he includes himself naming it however he wishes, this next one would actually be the third condition. But Rakrak didn't care about the numbering, as he just casually continued to his third condition. And seeing how determined Rakrak was, Zap just let him do what he pleases. In response, Rakrak cast his gaze towards Zap and told it that it needs to believe in God as well. This shocked Zap beyond belief, but before it could respond, Rakrak clarified that not just any god, it should trust and believe in their nameless beetle god. But as expected, Zap flashed in refusal. The other conditions are fine, but that will be hard for Zap, since it is a spirit of demonic magic. It was created from an existence that has been around longer than gods. Rakrak lightly hit his tail on the ground. The group who was with Rakrak noticed his discomfort and checked up on him. Jal asked if there was something wrong and if the pain in his hand was okay and Rakrak simply said he was fine. Rakrak then focused on Zap and asserted that its origins, the hows and whys of its birth, were irrelevant. What mattered was its intentions and actions moving forward. Rakrak then questioned Zap on why it desired freedom. Zap replied with a straightforward reason. It was inherent to its nature. As a spirit of demonic magic, its primary goal was to disseminate demonic magic as widely as possible among various beings. This was the fundamental purpose of its existence. In response, Rakrak admits that Zap seem useful enough to him, and their nameless beetle god happens to be generous towards useful beings, so it was possible that their god may listen to and fulfill Zap's desires. And the reason why it was made is not important, as they believe that the reason for one's own existence is determined by themselves, not by the one who created them. Zap then steadily slowed its fluttering, and told Rakrak that what he wants is impossible since gods do not like spirits of demonic magic. But Rakrak, who has an unwavering conviction, countered that Zap shouldn't judge their god through the lens it looks at the world with. And seeing the stern look on Rakrak's face, Zap inquired whether Rakrak's god would truly accept a being like itself, which Rakrak confirmed, provided that it accepts all the conditions he offered. And he reassured Zap not to worry. He may not know all of God's wishes, but he is the one who understands his wishes best among everyone who knows of him. And with this hidden ability of Rakrak, exuding infinite charisma through his eyes and voice ultimately swayed Zap's decision. Consequently, Zap chose to confess that it have actually lied to him about a few things. Zap revealed that it is not just simply trapped in this ancient ruin. It is true that a challenger of the ruin must defeat the ruin's guard, but that guard is under its rule. It controls everything in this ruin. Furthermore, Zap admitted to sending the demonic magic enchanted nutrias to them lizardmen, which Rakrak feigned surprise at this revelation. But in truth, he was not taken aback. And he also understood the reason why Zap told him that he needed to defeat the guard. And that is because the power shouldn't be given to those who are weak, since they wouldn't be able to widely spread Zap's powers. And Zap confirmed this reasoning. And recently, the Frogmen tribe had also come to attempt the challenge. However, they didn't deserve it, which Rakrak thought that was obvious. Meanwhile, Zap was surprised that Rakrak was taking it well rather than before. And therefore, Zap quickly pointed out to Rakrak that it had deceived him and questioned why he wasn't more upset by this revelation. And Rakrak simply shook his head in response, as he had already anticipated the deception, and he was not the type of lizard man to become upset just because he was deceived without even losing anything. And he can always forgive when he wishes to, even though forgiveness isn't a virtue of a warrior, but he is also the tribal chief. And forgiveness and reconciliation are indeed virtues of a tribal chief. This surprised Zap, and now it found itself viewing Rakrak in a new light. But even before Zap could react further, 
Rakrak expressed that he understands where Zap is coming from, not as a warrior, tribal chief, or high priest, but as a lizard man and as an individual. Getting twisted isn't strange after living in a wet, dark place like this. Always looking at monster rats, so it seems like it could use some fresh air outside and look at beautiful things. Zap immediately flashed with excitement, and Rakrak stopped walking and watched it. Then Zap inquired about his name, which Rakrak promptly responded, and with that, Zap addressed him by his name and declared that the test is over. It will accept all the conditions he have offered, which made Rakrak delighted. At the same time, at Nebula's side of things, a system interface popped up, notifying him of a demonic magic spirit wishes to be subjugated to him. If he accept, he will receive demonic magic area, electricity, which Nebula immediately clicked yes. And now it was done. Nebula felt a sense of satisfaction. This outcome was the best possible scenario he had hoped for. The key to circumventing the penalties associated with demonic magic lay in transferring it to the divinity area. Without this transfer, each individual imbued with demonic magic would be labeled as demonic magic enchanted and become uncontrollable. However, once demonic magic was housed within the divinity area, it could be managed and controlled effectively. This strategic move ensured a balance and maintainable use of this potent power. And just as Zap accepted Rakrak's conditions, it became feasible to bestow demonic magic upon select individuals. However, transferring this power to the divinity area did not transform it into divinity, nor could it be leveled up like other abilities in the divinity area. There were specific limitations to its use. Nonetheless, the absence of penalties was a victory in itself, and if breaking through the ancient ruin was all that was needed to be done to obtain demonic power, that would be more than worth it. Rakrak's group would win even if hundreds of those monster rats came attacking them. And if needed, Nebula could always support them by using faith points. However, subjugating a spirit of demonic magic was much more difficult to do. Nebula didn't even know if it would be possible. The only way to find out was to wait and see what would happen depending on each character's abilities. And Nebula seemed to have gotten lucky again and succeeded in doing so. However, Nebula didn't think this was mere coincidence. Meeting Rakrak seems to have been good luck for the both of them, suggesting a significant and potentially beneficial connection between them. After that, several days had passed. There were two figures standing at the top of a hill. Among the pair was a lizard man, proudly telling the story about how the blue insect god gave Rakrak the power of thunder and lightning. And this is the end of the story of how the Chosen Ones came to be among their black-scaled lizardmen tribe. And that was nine years ago. The lizardmen told this as they were in front of a tower made from tombstones and water buffalo bones, stacked and assembled with plaster to build a structure tall enough to be seen from far away in the wilderness. This bone tower was built on top of the old one that Rakrak had first created, and was not only used as a way to show faith in the blue insect god, but also used as a milestone now. Finishing telling the long story, the black-scaled lizardmen gently dust one of the stone monuments. This lizardman wore expensive layers of a fabric called silk which indicated he belonged to a high social class. But the man on the other hand, looked shabby. On his head was a questionable piece of leather that didn't seem properly tanned, and he had a bushy beard. Still, the man was quite friendly with the lizardman, and thinks what he just told was an interesting story. But there was one thing that he can't wrap around his mind, so he pointed out that the god the lizard believes in is an insect god. So he doesn't get what does that have to do with thunder and lightning. And the lizardman just tilted his head. He didn't seem thrown off by the question though, it was more of a tilt that questioned why this man would be asking about such a thing. Still, he answered the man by a question, asking it what color is the lightning, which the man answered blue. The lizard man then pointed out that that their deity is referred to as the blue insect god, that's why. But the human did not understand what the lizardman meant by that. So he just begun to think that lizard men are always convinced and swayed by the strangest things. They're so odd. This man didn't think being odd was necessarily a bad thing though. But he was convinced that he might be able to take advantage of the fact that they're odd. Hiding his innermost thoughts, the man introduced himself as Hui, and then asked the lizardman what his name was, which the lizardman was about to answer. But he noticed something from the distance, so he promptly apologized for cutting their conversations short, as he think there's some uninvited guests coming over. At far below, there was a group of armed gnolls walking through the valley. This hyena-like species had protruding snouts and black spots on their brown bodies. They had rough tempers and were obsessive over power structures, so they fought frequently amongst themselves. But the overall opinion of the players of the Lost World was that they were still worthy of consideration despite all these shortcomings. Their physical ability and intelligence were both high on average, so they were known to be a good species to have at the start of the game, regardless of what the player's small area was. But these facts about the game had no bearing on the Lizard Man and the man named Hui. The Lizard Man then asked Hui he thinks they are Sulkite's men. 
Salkit was the tribal chief of the Knoll tribe, also known as the Earcut tribe, which were hostile towards the black-scaled lizardmen. The black-scaled lizardmen from the south and the Earscut tribe from the northeast were the two largest tribes of the wilderness, so all the other smaller tribes had great interest in the two. Salkate and Rakrak believed in different gods. Therefore, it was inevitable for both tribal chiefs to be hostile towards each other. The man named Hui took great interest in whether the two tribes were going to fight, and if they did, who would win, excluding the human tribe, of course. At least within this specific wilderness would be comparable to these two powerful tribes. But he decided to reply with a bit of sincerity. So the man took a closer look at the Knoll group coming up the hill and came to a conclusion. He doesn't think they're Salkite's men, since it's strange that they would come to this area. If they were Salkite's men and part of the Ears Cut tribe, Rakrak would definitely know of them coming this way. And they wouldn't be wandering around here so fearlessly. And he thinks that these group of Knolls is just used to be part of Salkite's tribe, but were driven out because of infighting. That kind of situation is common for Knolls. They might look armed, but if they look closely, it's clearly a sham. That one doesn't even have a knife. He's just holding a wooden club. Which the lizard man accepted Hui's explanation to be reasonable. But he thinks it's because they aren't cautious of their surroundings at all. If they were Selkit's scouting party, they would search the mountain ridge first and wouldn't take that smooth path. They look tired and exhausted, so they are vagrants. And if they were a scouting party of the Ears Cut tribe, they would actually be friendly. They would know that getting into such a trivial battle is meaningless. And both scouting parties would rather have a meal together and try to get information from each other. In this context, the lizardman reached for an arrow. In doing so, he unveiled his true identity. It turned out he was Owen all along, and he was about to deliver the most electrifying greeting that the Knolls would die for. As Owen was about to use his bow, the man recognized it right away. It's the black-scaled lizardman's composite bow. The composite bow was made from the large water buffaloes that the black-scaled lizardmen were raising, and it was one of the bows that could shoot the farthest out of all the other bows in the wilderness. The black-scaled lizardmen only produced a specific number of the bows to arm each of their warriors, and they wouldn't ever trade them for anything. So the composite bows of the black-scaled lizardmen that others had were either extremely expensive or counterfeits. But Howie doesn't understand why Owen is taking out his bow already. It's still too far. But as if rebutting the man's thoughts, Owen didn't hesitate to take his shot, and the distance between him and the knolls was still over a hundred steps. So the knolls who were marching with their heads down hadn't spotted Owen. And only as the bowstring was released did one knoll catch a fleeting glimpse of Owen, but it was too late for any defensive action. Luckily, the arrow just struck the ground amidst their ranks, and clueless of the arrow's true nature. The knolls initially mistook it for a regular misplaced shot, and so the leader shouted to alert his mates of an enemy attack. However, he soon realized that his attempts were futile. He was already too late, as he could already feel the chills rush through their bodies, making their hairs stand. And suddenly, an intense burst of thunderbolt descended from where the arrow had been, which in turn made the gnolls close their eyes, but their eyelids didn't completely shield them from the intense light. And then the electricity soon reached them, electrifying them just enough to let them barely alive. With this, one of the gnolls then remembered the famous legend among the black-scaled lizardmen, the Chosen Ones, and it was no doubt that they were against one such formidable figure. So they immediately decided to run as fast as they could. At the same time, the man was left in awe at the display of Owen's formidable abilities. The scene where Owen effortlessly overpowered the gnolls with a single, strategically placed arrow revealed a level of skill and power that was both impressive and intimidating. Meanwhile, Owen, who was seemingly accustomed to such feats, was just sheepishly smiling as he watched the gnolls flee in panic and disarray. He was satisfied with the outcome, knowing that sparing their lives meant they were unlikely to seek immediate revenge. After the confrontation was resolved, Owen took the opportunity to introduce himself to the man, which in turn surprises him, as he couldn't believe that he was in the presence of an important figure, Owen the Storyteller, which flattered Owen, but he modestly downplayed his importance, suggesting that he wasn't as significant as the man believed, and because it's been a while since he used his power, Owen suggested to take a break and just talk for a moment. During this pause, Owen took out a long stick. The end of the stick was round and was then filled with grass and was lighted up, so that he could breathe a white smoke out from his mouth. Meanwhile, Hui just stood there and wasn't surprised by this at all, as he knew what the stick was. It's a smoking pipe and tobacco, the ritual tool that the chosen black-scaled lizardmen use. Still, Hui couldn't help but wonder if the lizardmen really needs to smoke that Zaza after they use their power. While pondering this, he respectfully gave Owen space to enjoy his session, patiently waiting for him to finish before they would continue their conversation. But since Owen is hitting that pipe, 
and was feeling the vibe around him, he immediately noticed the man's silence. And so he told Hui that he can ask him things if he wants to. This prompted the man to ask why he goes around alone when he have that much power. But this just made Owen slightly puzzled. So he responded that he doesn't understand what he meant by that. Because how would he go around alone if he didn't have this power? Or if he were weak as shit for that matter? And the man couldn't find fault in his logic. So he decided to make his question clearer. And asks Owen again, the reason why does he follow someone when he is this powerful? There would be others who follow him within the black-scaled lizardmen tribe. And even if there isn't, he would be able to find other lizardmen somewhere out there and live a comfortable life. And from what he knows, the storyteller Owen always goes around alone, like a vagrant, lonely and dangerous. But this just made Owen laugh as if he just heard a funny story. After that, Owen soberly explained that he had his own reasons for his actions, mentioning that he carried the weight of many sins. This surprised the man, since he had witnessed so many lizardmen that respect him, which Owen clarified that he is indeed a sinner. But it is also true that he has been forgiven by many of those in their tribe. But the feeling that he has is more of a personal atonement issue. He can't forgive himself. With these simple words, the man understood what he meant. And as the man nodded, Owen assured him that there was no need for sympathy, as he had discovered his own path to self-forgiveness. And this was it. He goes around telling stories of the blue insect god and Rakrak -rak the tribal chief, through storytelling and writing, and sometimes giving fear as well. After all that was cleared up, Owen tucked away his smoking pipe, and asked Hui where is he heading, as he seemed like a vagrant as well. Hui, with a thoughtful scratch of his beard, saw no reason to conceal the truth. So he answered truthfully that he is not a vagrant, and he came from automation. Automation was an isolated valley located at the southwest end of the wilderness. A human tribe had settled down where the springs flowed, and at the entrance of the valley was a fortress made from soil. It was called a fortress, but it actually wasn't built by humans. It was named Automation because, through an ancient mystery, there existed ancient mud soldiers reaching a human's waist in height that continuously restored the fortress when it broke down. And because of this, the human tribe that succeeded in occupying the place were able to protect themselves from the other large tribes. Automation was also a place that the ears-cut gnolls and black-scaled lizardmen were keeping an eye on. And it seems like Hui is an errand boy from Automation, and he is on his way to the black-scaled lizardmen to deliver the words of the Lord of Automation. And so Owen immediately apologized as he didn't recognize a guest, but this was a good coincidence for him, which made Hui puzzled. So he asks what he meant by that, but Owen didn't answer it and just whistled. And in the distance, a silhouette of a beast suddenly materialized. But as it drew close, it revealed to be a harsh-looking chicken which was about 2.5 meters tall. And Howie only knew one monster with this kind of look. So he assumed that it was a cockatrice, which Owen immediately clarified that it's a corka, not a cockatrice. And so the man then realized what it was. This is that famous cockatrice and chicken crossbreed. Still, he is not sure how the lizardmen even made it possible, as the quarkas were a creature that only a small portion of the lizardmen warriors could ride. Overall, it had the appearance of a cockatrice but it was smaller and more gentle. The black-scaled lizardmen weren't able to tame cockatrices, but they did succeed in crossbreeding Quarka. Alongside the Chosen Ones, these Quarka warriors were one of the main reasons the black-scaled lizardmen had a both prestige and evil reputation. Since Quarkas can run several times faster than people, and the black lizardmen can shoot their composite bows hundreds of steps away from their targets. But since Hui is their guest, he doesn't have to feel scared, and Owen already made up his mind that he should also treat him generously. And so he invited Hui to join him on his quarka, as he was planning to visit Rakrak -rak as well. This gesture of offering a ride was both practical and courteous, allowing Hui to travel more comfortably and efficiently. But this wasn't free either, as Owen playfully told him that he will have to listen to his stories along the way, which made Hui let out a soft and concerned laugh, as he realized that their journey will be a long one. True to his word, Owen began to share stories about the blue insect god and the saga of Rakrak. -rak. At a later time, Within black-scaled lizardmen tribe, their flag soared proudly. The tribe was on the move again, venturing through the wilds to reach a new destination. But now their travel methods had evolved, showcasing a readiness for any future challenges. As each warrior was mounted, vigilantly safeguarding the tribe members and their herd, and leading the way was Rakrak, -rak, perched atop a massive monstrous bird. And from his elevated position, Rakrak -rak could effortlessly survey the entire surroundings. Those who had never met Rakrak -rak wouldn't know. But the black-scaled lizardmen hadn't completely failed in taming cockatrices. The large monstrous bird was a cockatrice that was over 3.5 meters tall, and Rakrak -rak was the only individual who somewhat succeeded in taming one. One could think it was a shame there was only one special case, but it was due to the success of taming the large monstrous bird that the Quarkus were born. But as he was minding his business, 
an errand boy suddenly came to him and whispered that Stargazer wanted to see him now, which shocked Rockrack. This could only mean one thing. And so, he turns his cockatrice and command for the procession to stop. As Rockrack shouted, each lizardman warrior in the middle of the other processions repeated his words to all the other lizardmen. The processions of black-scaled lizardmen that were large enough to make dust clouds instantly stopped at Rockrack's orders. While Rockrack immediately went towards where Stargazer was, and as Rockrack got down from the large monstrous bird, Jaol, who was following behind him, came down from her corka and asked what's wrong, to which Rockrack explained that Stargazer had requested to see him, while also saying that his life is on the line, which Jaol understood, so she lets Rockrack be, but she couldn't hide her emotions, remarking that it would be a sad night, which Rockrack was well aware, and that old wise man has correctly predicted the days ahead of them as well as his own, so he thinks that Stargazer will be correct again this time. And so Rakrak continued to walk to Stargazer. The old lizardman had done a lot for Rakrak and the black-scaled lizardmen. He went by many names because he refused to respond to only one name. But now, he was most commonly referred to as the Elder by the tribe members. As Stargazer had first led Rakrak and his clan from the hill with the tower all the way to where the frogmen had initially settled down, and after that, he led them to more places farther away. And Rakrak had learned how to look at the stars from him. So the two always talked about stars. Stargazer even named the stars so others would be able to learn as well. And as a result, the warriors, herbalists, and buffalo herders all learned how to read the stars to prevent getting lost. Before, the lizardmen had always learned about the earth and believed that the earth provided them with everything, and thus they weren't too keen on learning things about the sky. But as time passed, they came to realize that knowledge about the sky was useful. Those who went away from the tribe and got lost found their ways back by looking at the stars. And those who wanted to sleep by the rivers looked at how low the birds flew, and by the movement of the stars, the lizardmen were able to know when flowers bloomed and when plants withered. The intelligent black-scaled lizardmen wanted to gain more knowledge of the earth and the sky, so they would go to Stargazer to discuss and explore more about where the stars came from, how the positions of the stars had changed, and how they would change in the future. And oftentimes, the end of another busy day would find Rakrak sitting down with Stargazer, tired but with a languid look on his face. Stargazer would sit with his back hunched but his eyes shining, and they would exchange questions and answers between them. Rockrack used to give gifts to thank Stargazer for continuously teaching the young lizardmen about his wisdom, even though he was old and tired. But Stargazer always turned the gifts down with a wave of his hand, believing that he couldn't accept this considering all that the tribal chief has done for him, as the tribal chief was the one who accepted him even when he was a vagrant. In response, Rockrack insisted that there was no need for thanks. He pointed out that it wasn't just him who had welcomed Stargazer, but the entire tribe had accepted him. While Stargazer agreed with Rakrak's sentiment, he still felt indebted to at least one person, and suggested Rakrak to take the gifts back. And Stargazer was good with words, so it was hard for Rakrak to win an argument with him. However, Rakrak was quick-witted. He would quickly hide his gifts in Stargazer's tent when Stargazer wasn't looking during their conversations. And when Stargazer found these gifts and brought them back to Rakrak, asking where they came from, Rockrack would say he knew nothing of them. They spent many years making these small jokes, but Rockrack suddenly realized that these small jokes would come to an end, and he felt like a part of his heart was tearing apart. Then as Rockrack entered Stargazer's tent, a herbalist who was beside Stargazer's bed got up. In turn, he immediately inquired if Stargazer was okay. Respectfully, the herbalist answered that the Elder has lived a very long time and is very exhausted now. And with Stargazer eyes half closed, he opened his mouth and added that he is also tired. As he had studied a lot and taught a lot of people, he has traveled back and forth, here and there, even to places he has never been. He has lost an arm, got kicked out, and remained as a loner for a long time. There will always come a time when they become extremely exhausted. As far as he knows, there's only one cure to this illness, and that is to sleep forever. And Rakrak just slowly nodded and admitted what he hadn't wanted to admit, and sat beside Stargazer. And all that remained in the tent was Rakrak. Stargazer, and a torchlight flickering in the background, setting a somber tone for their conversation. And so Rakrak started the conversation by casually mentioning that he had heard that Stargazer wanted to see him. Prompting Stargazer to explain that was because he wanted to indulge in some extravagance before he leaves. This puzzled Rakrak, so he asked what does he meant by that, which Stargazer replied that he thinks time is very valuable. He has lived his life without greed and tried to take as little as possible of what belonged to others, but this is his last moment. So he wanted to steal time from the busiest lizard men in this tribe. This made Rakrak laugh. Still, he doesn't think Stargazer would have called him just for one last joke, which Stargazer confirmed, and disclosed the real purpose behind summoning him, and that he has a question, 
one that only Rockrack was deemed worthy enough to answer. But before posing his question, he told Rakrak to think of it as a question not for tribal chief Rakrak, but for high priest Rakrak, the first chosen one, and the one closest to God, which Rakrak understood, so he asked Stargazer to proceed. And so Stargazer started to inquire what happens after death. Stargazer's question to Rakrak about the afterlife was a testament to his depth of insight as one of the more perceptive members of the black-scaled Lizardman tribe. But Rakrak, who is usually a figure of authority and knowledge within the tribe, found himself unexpectedly at a loss for words in response to this profound question. And despite being well-versed in the tales and rituals that the tribe held about death, and having witnessed significant battles where many warriors lost their lives, Rakrak realized the limitations of his knowledge on this subject. He had always offered prayers for the deceased, hoping they would find peace in a better place. However, he acknowledged the uncertainty that surrounded this belief. The true knowledge of what happens after death remained a mystery, one that he could not unravel until he himself passed away. And observing Rakrak's silence, which seemed to indicate he was carefully contemplating how to articulate his thoughts, Stargazer continued with his line of questioning. He pondered if the fate of the departed souls would enter a state of eternal dreaming, and if in such a dream, they lose their sense of identity and purpose, existing in a realm beyond comprehension. And the anxiety in his voice was evident, reflecting a deep concern about the unknown, a concern shared by Rakrak. But still, the question remained unanswered, and so Stargazer's questions then took a darker turn, asking if there is also a possibility of eternal nightmares. But Rakrak, who wasn't sure either, hesitated, and just asked why Stargazer thinks he is worthy enough to answer that question, showing to Stargazer that he was also in the dark about this subject. But Stargazer believes that Rakrak has a possible answer, he just doesn't know where to start looking for it. This prompted for Stargazer to offer his perspective on the subject. He reflected on how the blue insect god had been their guiding light during times of loss and despair. Based on this belief, he expressed hope that the same deity would continue to guide them in the afterlife. However, this was only a speculation of a mortal lizardman like him, and so he still felt the need to sought confirmation from Rakrak, asking if this notion aligned with God's will. And Rakrak pondered deeply over this profound question. After careful consideration, he agreed with Stargazer, affirming that the blue insect god, who had guided them in life, would likely extend that guidance beyond death. With this, Stargazer had a somewhat satisfied look on his face. Yet he delved deeper into the topic by asking Rakrak what kind of place he imagined the afterlife to be, prompting Rakrak to share his vision of the afterlife. He imagined it as a vast expanse, where one could run endlessly, feeling the ground crunch underfoot and the meadows gently brushing against one's tail. This depiction painted a picture of boundless freedom and comfort, a stark contrast to the limitations of their current physical forms. Stargazer, initially remarking on his own inability to run due to age, was reminded by Rakrak that in the afterlife, they would shed their old bodies. This realization brought a sense of nostalgia to Stargazer, who recalled the days of his youth when he could walk and run freely. Finding common ground in this shared vision, Rakrak further described a landscape where one could rest on a large boulder when tired, suggesting a serene and peaceful environment. This led Stargazer to inquire about the weather in such a place, which Rakrak immediately answered that it'll always be good, but he then took it back, as he thinks that it wouldn't be fun if it's always the same. So sometimes it'll be gloomy and rainy. And now that he thinks of it, it would also be nice if there's a river. And Stargazer being encapsulated by Rakrak's vision, then added that he wants there to be a house that he can rest in. To which Rakrak responded that there would likely be various forms of shelter available, such as structures made of mud or wood, or even tents. However, Stargazer expressed a specific aversion to tents, revealing a deeper sentiment. He had grown weary of a nomadic lifestyle, which tents symbolized to him. The idea of constantly moving from one place to another had become unappealing to the Elder, who now longed for a more permanent and stable dwelling. Upon hearing this, Rakrak realized that he hadn't fully understood Stargazer's experiences and feelings, so he apologized for not realizing it sooner. But Stargazer just shook his head, reassuring him that there was no need for regret, since he found a place for his heart to settle down at. So he has no other complaints while he is still alive. After he dies is the problem. And so Rakrak continued to elaborate on his vision of the afterlife, assuring Stargazer that the house he longed for would indeed exist there, a sturdy one that doesn't move anywhere. It might be a house built with rocks, offering the permanence and stability Stargazer craved. And with the topic of shelter settled, Stargazer's curiosity turned to the subject of food in the afterlife. And so Rakrak shared that he would probably always be able to eat as much as he wants, and it seems like everything would be there. But Stargazer thinks he might feel lonely being alone in a big place like that. But Rakrak shrugged, as he believed that Stargazer wouldn't be alone. There are already those who have gone before them, 
and even Rakrak and the others will all be there someday, so Stargazer won't be lonely, and when the time comes that they meet again, they can then talk about stars, as they still have lots to talk about. This surprised Stargazer, so he curiously asked Rakrak if he truly believes that there will be stars there as well, to which Rakrak immediately answered yes. Even he who was unsure of the afterlife, replied as if it was obvious this time, and this was because the stars always show them the way. So there will be those who wander around lost there too, and God will have definitely put stars in the sky for them to easily find a way back. This reasoning resonated with Stargazer, bringing a smile to his face as he found solace in Rakrak's words. However, as the conversation drew to a close, Stargazer's energy seemed to wane, and as Rakrak was tending to Stargazer, he noticed a blue butterfly entered the tent and was trying to land on the back of his hand. It was a sign, an answer from the blue insect god, a sign of positivity. And so Rakrak smiled, as he now knows the blue insect god had been listening to their conversation. And so he excitedly pointed out to Stargazer if he sees this as well. While Rakrak slowly brought his hand in front of Stargazer's eyes, so the butterfly wouldn't fly away. However, there was no response from Stargazer. And for a moment, Rakrak feared the worst. So Rakrak was about to shake Stargazer's body, thinking he had died. But then he realized Stargazer was still with him, and was just quietly saying something, asking if he was still around which Rakrak softly answered that he was. But now it was clear that Stargazer had lost his vision. Death was approaching for him. This realization filled Rakrak with a sense of sorrow, since the blue butterfly was known amongst the black-scaled lizardmen tribe as a sign of positivity, as well as miracles. Even if it wasn't this butterfly which glowed with a mysterious blue light, the lizardmen were always happy when they saw any blue butterfly, thinking it was a good sign, and Stargazer would certainly recognize it too. So Rakrak was agonizing, but then he suddenly remembered the small joke he would make with Stargazer. So he immediately asked Stargazer if he was still there, which he confirmed. And so Rakrak told him that he brought him a gift, and he will leave it here. And just like before, Stargazer knew that even if he declines Rakrak's gift, he would just be fooling around and sneak it somehow. And so Stargazer confidently murmured that he will find it right away this time, with a smile on his face. And as the last breath of Stargazer reached the blue butterfly, the blue butterfly flapped its wings and flew away from Rakrak's hand. Rakrak somehow knew it was his last breath. Rakrak lightly shook Stargazer's body while calling his name. And when he confirmed Stargazer was no longer breathing, he called the herbalist in, while the blue butterfly flew out of the tent and continued flying into the sky, over the black-scaled lizardmen tribe as they busily prepared for encampment and the funeral, then the wilderness where dusk had arrived. Finally, the blue butterfly landed on the back of another hand. It was Nebula and he knew well what happens when someone dies in the lost world, and the conditions for creating the afterlife have been completed. So Nebula didn't hesitate to create it. Nebula knew he would eventually create an afterlife someday, after a player selected their first tribe, and the NPCs in the surrounding areas were defeated. A player's divinity level would reach 11. It was one of the required conditions to create an afterlife, and a player could reach the level if they played properly in the beginning. Then they would be called semi-deities. At that point on, it would be very difficult for XP to increase. Still, it doesn't matter for Nebula, as levels are only one of the additional factors to winning the game, and he is confident that no one would be at a higher level than he is right now. He is on the faster side of meeting all the conditions, level-wise, resource-wise, faith points-wise, and sufficient deaths. Each of these components played a significant role in his overarching plan, but the aspect of deaths held particular importance. This element was crucial in fulfilling the most vital condition for creating an afterlife within the game's universe. The four conditions Nebula focused on were interrelated yet distinct. Advancing to the requisite levels and defeating powerful NPCs like Abominations and Fiends to secure special resources, as well as gathering enough faith points, were relatively straightforward tasks. However, the last condition, related to death, was more enigmatic and complex, because once there were enough deaths of individuals that believed in the player, then the condition was known to be met. However, the specific formula for figuring out how many had to die was not provided in the Lost World, so the players had to make the calculations and figure it out themselves. There were cases where the condition wasn't fulfilled no matter how many had died, and there were cases where the conditions were easily met after the death of only a few individuals. Some say that it depends on how much faith points the individual generated, but that doesn't necessarily add up to Nebula, so he can't figure out what it is, but he has already met the conditions, so he chose not to be bothered by it further, and just focus on what up ahead. With this in mind, Nebula then opened the World Creation Helper version 2. He knew there would come a day where he would create an afterlife, so he had been modeling different kinds of afterlife he wanted from time to time using the World Creation Helper version 2, 
which was provided by the Lost Worlds system. Just like the creature creation helper Nebula used to make Stratus, there were worlds Nebula had created before, and worlds that other players had made saved in the world creation helper program. But just like last time, Nebula decided to make a new one, but the basic framework is pre-made, which was good, and he already knew what kind of afterlife each species preferred from his previous experiences in playing the game. While lizardmen all generally preferred the same type of afterlife, there was a certain kind of world lizardmen of a young civilization especially favored. Green fields with moist, humid air and warm sunny plains. And Nebula was somewhat relieved when he heard Rackrack and Stargazer imagining and talking about the afterlife because the afterlife he created wasn't too different from their descriptions. Nebula continued preparing the afterlife by pressing here and there within the World Creation Helper tab. The souls of those who died while having faith in the player would remain rather than disappear. It was up to the players if they wanted to collect the souls, and most of the time, they were collected because that was the only way an afterlife could be created. The souls would be the first ones to set foot in the afterlife Nebula created. And he couldn't just pass on this opportunity, since the afterlife was a very important element within the Lost World, as it was a factor in determining the view of life after death for those who believed in a god. For example, if an afterlife of hell was created, a god could show priests the image of hell through dreams. The priests would then learn from the dreams that those who were wicked would receive eternal punishment, and they would then spread that fact to the other believers. That way, the priests can tell the believers to uphold morality and ethics, but there's another way to compel them to do so. The concept of hell could be changed depending on a player's abilities and utilization. There were multiple ways to inform believers of what could make them go to hell. Players could have priests tell believers that doing bad things would land them in hell, but they could also have believers think that attacking a certain species or insulting a specific god could lead to the same fate. This type of gameplay was common in the Lost World. It was also common for the concept of heaven to be used together with hell. But there would be no reason to believe in a god if hell was the only destination after death, since punishments should always be paired with rewards. And it was also possible to create a world where the believers believed that they would go to heaven if they attacked a certain species, or insulted a specific god. And it was more than a matter of faith since this actually happened in the afterlife. But it wasn't possible for Nebula to create an afterlife of heaven and hell just yet, as he would need at least two afterlifes, but he can only make one right now. And reincarnation is also difficult, because there would need to be judges. As a result, Nebula was only able to create a type of afterlife called Different Worlds, and this particular afterlife is useful and a commonplace throughout history, such as Valhalla, Water of Forgetfulness, Styx, Limbo. They're all different from each other, but they all indicate worlds you would go to after you die. These worlds weren't necessarily individual worlds on their own, but more often used as spaces leading to other afterlifes. However, these weren't the only purposes for these worlds. Even in Valhalla, the afterlife was like a training place for warriors getting ready for Ragnarok. Afterlifes can really differ depending on how the players want to use them. And now that he thinks about it, there was a time he even won by utilizing the afterlife. But he did just got lucky though, and that is because souls would be immortal as long as an afterlife existed. It was hard to make use of the knowledge or powers that the souls possessed, because it consumed a lot of faith points. But as the game progressed into the later stages, the souls would become very helpful to the players. Nevertheless, there's no need to rush from the start. Many things are still in their inceptions, and so he decided to think flexibly, and just went through the next step. And that is to name his newly created afterlife, which he didn't hesitate to name it The First Prairie. It was a working title, allowing possibility for future expansion. Then the first prairie that was visible in the World Creation Helper appeared below Nebula's feet. Nebula opened his possessions window and scattered all the souls into the first prairie. Hundreds of souls turned into blue wandering butterflies, and they landed on the grassland. As soon as the spirits that believed themselves to be butterflies landed on grass, flowers, and dirt, they remembered they used to be lizardmen and turned back into their original forms before they died. But in the first prairie, they realized they weren't injured, exhausted or had deadly diseases. Meanwhile, Nebula concealed himself. There was a soul that Nebula needed to guide personally, and that is Stargazer, who is in a serene slumber upon a lush grass meadow. His rest so deep, it was as if he had been craving it for ages. Unexpectedly, a gentle tingle on his snout stirred him awake. He thought he would be forever sleepy, but when he opened his eyes, he felt refreshed. Lying down, his arms, legs, and tail moved as he wished. He never thought that the pain in his joints would ever go away, even in a dream. With this, Stargazer sat up. Immediately, he was presented with an astonishing view, where at first he thought it was a dream, but as he felt everything in his presence, he denounced the thought, as he was now certain that all of this isn't a dream. 
It was a green grassland, a gentle wind swept past, and Stargazer felt the humid but cool air on his nose. He thought his nose felt cold at first, but soon felt the warmth of the sun on his face. All was good. Then Stargazer easily remembered the last conversation he had with Rackrack. The conversation seemed like it had been a dream, but at the same time so very real and vivid. As he reflected on their exchange, his eyes sparkled with realization. Rackrack had been right. This was the prairie they had envisioned together. However, he noticed the absence of stars and the lack of stone houses they had imagined. It dawned on Stargazer that one doesn't always receive everything they wish for. Perhaps, in this realm, houses were unnecessary. Still, this insight brought a smile to his face as he recognized the beauty and serenity of this gift from their god, where he found himself in a tranquil paradise, where the sun's warmth was gentle and comforting, never becoming overbearing, and before him stretched an endless expanse of grass, inviting him to run freely in any direction he desired. The breeze seemed to embrace him wholly, welcoming his entire being with open arms. In this moment, Stargazer felt a profound sense of peace and fulfillment, as if he had truly found a place where he belonged a realm that resonated with his deepest desires and aspirations. Stargazer found himself utterly captivated by the splendor of the magnificent place he had arrived in. He became one with the environment, whistling harmoniously with the wind, an act that brought him a deep sense of peace and connection to the world around him. It was the tune that everyone sang after the black-scaled lizardmen defeated the frogmen and the villages were restored. It had a good rhythm, so everyone liked it, but Stargazer always hummed it because he wasn't so good at singing. He was even shy about humming it as well, so he only did it when there was no one around. As he indulged in this serene activity, something in his peripheral vision caught his attention, prompting him to turn his gaze. To his realization, he discovered he was not alone in this tranquil afterlife. Scattered across the vast expanse of grass, he saw other lizardmen. They were lying down, each in their own space, faces turned upwards towards the sky with their eyes peacefully closed. Stargazer found himself in a state of contemplation as he wandered amidst his resting kin. He debated internally whether to rouse the other lizardmen from their peaceful slumber. Observing their tranquil expressions, he felt it might be discourteous to disturb their rest. This dilemma reflected his deep respect and consideration for his fellow tribesmen. But as he looked at them closely, Stargazer recognized several familiar faces among the resting lizardmen. One in particular caught his eye, a young warrior who had left an indelible mark on his memory. This young lizard man had played a crucial role during a critical moment for the black-scaled lizard men. When they faced an attack from a goblin tribe significantly larger than Rakrak's clan, Stargazer vividly recalled the harrowing encounter. The goblin forces had managed to split Rakrak's clan into two, isolating Rakrak at the front and Yur at the rear. Both leaders swiftly rallied their warriors and mounted a fierce resistance. However, the most vulnerable members of the clan, the children and the elderly, found themselves dangerously exposed in the midst of the chaos. It was during this moment of crisis that the young warrior, whom Stargazer now observed in peaceful rest, had made a significant impact. His bravery and actions during the attack had been instrumental in safeguarding the lives of those caught in the middle of the conflict. As the young warrior had learned arithmetics, he now can understand that it was logical to sacrifice one life to save many others. And so a few youngsters had charged at the dozens of goblins, and through those heroic sacrifices that no one had wished for, the lizard men were able to defeat the goblin tribe. Some of the Lizardmen survived their heroic act, and some didn't. The Lizardmen warrior in front of Stargazer was one of those that hadn't survived, and Rakrak had been deeply affected by the loss. So he'd gotten mad and yelled at those who survived, and even at those who died at their funerals. He even yelled at Stargazer, and blame it all on the arithmetics that he thought them, because all the ones who were smart and good at arithmetics went against his orders and charged at the goblins. They were so stupid, sacrificing one life to save two. They thought this was a good exchange. But Rakrak was angrier at this fact, since Rakrak knew they weren't wrong, and there's nothing else he can do than be angry. However, what annoyed Rakrak the most was what happened after that. Someone seemed to have overheard the conversation between Rakrak and Stargazer, and all the other warriors who initially didn't care about arithmetics went to Stargazer to learn afterwards. Since then, the warriors who were good at calculations always died first when there was a fight, and then others would go to Stargazer to learn how to do calculations. Stargazer taught them secretly being careful not to annoy Rakrak even more. The warrior sound asleep in front of Stargazer was the one who led many other warriors of the clan to learn calculations. Happy to see the warrior, Stargazer put his hand on the warrior's shoulder, but pulled back without shaking the warrior awake, as he decided to wake him up later, as it doesn't seem like there's anything to do in this place anyways. And since he is the only one who is awake, Stargazer assumed that he woke up quicker than the others, because he had died recently. 
and that the others hadn't escaped the lingering effects of death yet. But since he was alone, he wondered if God is present, as there's something he had wanted to ask. But as he looked for the divine being, he saw a lizardman tail sticking out from between the trees. Without giving an answer, the tail swayed back and forth before disappearing. So it seems there was someone else who was awake, and with this, Stargazer immediately called out to it, but the tail was about to disappear from his field of vision as he did this. And with this, Stargazer stood up and began to walk faster, thinking he might lose the lizard man. Walking fast felt awkward as it was something he hadn't been able to do until now. Then Stargazer broke into a jog and was soon running after the lizard man, whose tail kept appearing and disappearing among the trees. Stargazer remembered that he used to enjoy running like this when he was younger. When he was a child, he used to run with a friend that he couldn't recall the face or name of anymore and Stargazer didn't feel all that bad while calling after the lizard men. The tail was leading him somewhere. Once he passed through some bushes, a small clearing appeared. There was a stone building, one Stargazer had never seen before. The building was cylindrical, made of rectangular stones, and had a domed ceiling. The tail swayed back and forth at the entrance of the building, and suddenly disappeared as if it had gotten sucked inside. He thought to himself that the person he was chasing won't be able to run away as long as they're in there. And so, Stargazer whose body was hot from all the running, entered the building. There was a blue light at the end of the dark corridor. The light was familiar to Stargazer, but as he walked by on the dark corridor, he was thinking that maybe there is a possibility that the divine being is here. Because if it was the case, he would like to ask a question that had been lingering on his mind for years. He wanted to know why they were exactly chosen by God, as he couldn't quite understand. Why did the blue insect god save them, protect them, and help them with miracles? Was it because lizard men were superior to other races? But it seems like it wasn't the case, since the other species seemed to lose either because they didn't have a god, or their gods weren't as powerful as theirs, or was it was because god is good? But what makes them better than the other species? Are the other species not as kind-hearted as they are? Or is it because they would be useful? Then would it be right for them to rely on god? What if they were no longer useful one day? There was no clear answer to these questions, but Stargazer thought that Raykrak's answer was the best out of all the others. Even if it wasn't the right answer, Rakrak always suggested answers that Stargazer liked. Rakrak said it could have been a coincidence, that maybe there was no other choice. Just like how they couldn't be with better species on a better land. Maybe God did all that he could. In a way, it could sound disrespectful. But Stargazer thought it was okay, because it means that they were the best outcome. And not long after, Stargazer walked through the corridor and came face to face with a night sky. Projected to the ceiling was the same night sky of the world that he was familiar with. The stars weren't drawn, but actual stars that shone on their own, and the depth of the dark sky was no different than the real one. And therefore, he thought to himself that Rakrak was right once again. The stone house, and now the stars. Then Stargazer looked around to find the owner of the tail he had been chasing, but the building was empty. However, Stargazer's attention was already on the night sky, and not the tail. He scanned from one end to the other and realized that the sky was even moving the way he had remembered. But that wasn't the end of it. In the middle of the room, there was a strange mechanical device that looked like it would be found in an ancient ruin. It was a long cylinder made with brass, and there was a round crystal glass embedded on both ends of the cylinder. It was set up on a platform with a chair to sit on, silently inviting one to look into the strange device. For a moment, Stargazer simply stood there, wondering if it would be okay for him to touch the device. He decided it would be fine since there was no one around. After touching different parts of the device, he put his eye to the bottom crystal glass. As soon as he did this, he was visibly shocked from what he saw, as Stargazer repeatedly moved away from the crystal glass to look at the night sky with his naked eyes, and looked back into the glass again. He then loosened and tightened the handle on the cylindrical-shaped device, as he realized that this is what the stars truly looked like. Everything he knew before was just superficial, so he felt the need to recalculate the movement of the stars, and Stargazer continuously looked at the mechanical device, without becoming bored of it, when suddenly, a thought came to mind. It would be amazing if he could pass this knowledge on to those still alive. In Stargazer's opinion, knowledge about the stars was one of the ways to do calculations, and if one knew how to do calculations, they could figure out the size and location of everything in the world, which would allow them to predict what would happen in the future. But as far as Stargazer could remember, there had never been a time where someone from the dead had returned. And if one can't go back once they are dead, why did God make a place like this? Just to see an old lizardman be happy? But Stargazer knew that couldn't be the case. So he stroked the mechanical device, and remembered what Rakrak had said, that God always does his best. He doesn't do anything for no reason. So he was confident that this knowledge will certainly become useful in the future. As this happened, the god that Stargazer wanted to meet all this time was right behind him, 
and Nebula was glad that Stargazer followed him well, and his assumptions were right. The afterlife is not only a place for the dead to go, but also hugely influences the view of life after death and the values of those who believed in God. If warriors went to an afterlife, the species of the warriors would dream of Valhalla, and if immortals with special powers entered the afterlife, their species would dream of a beautiful and peaceful place. Then what if a scholar enters the afterlife? The afterlife would certainly lay the groundwork for technological advancement. Nebula gave stargazers back a final look before stepping down from the platform and exiting the first observatory, delighted of what stargazer had contributed, especially since a new threat is approaching. Nebula had been fairly busy for the past few years. He had to take caution of the players that were slowly starting to expand their areas while also assisting Rockrack in defeating the NPCs nearby. And in the past few years, there hadn't been any big problems. Nebula intended to take over the entire peninsula and gather all the lizardmen. And if time was on his side, he believed it would be possible to do so without running into many issues. The United Lizardmen would naturally gain the upper hand over the other tribes, which would also make them influential. The weaker tribes would have no other choice but to accept and believe in the black-scaled Lizardman's god. However, a Null tribe suddenly appeared from the north. Nebula had to temporarily give up his goal of taking over the peninsula and led Rakrek's clan north. It was clear that this Gnoll tribe belonged to another player rather than stemming from an NPC event. The Earscut tribe was a tribe that Nebula should keep an eye out for. They were a large tribe, and since they were a nomadic tribe rather than an agricultural one, their combat power was not to be underestimated. The Lizardmen had Karokas, and the Gnolls had Sabertooth Tigers. The Gnolls hadn't been able to advance their bows much, but their metal smelting technology was better than the Lizardmen's. It was likely a technique that they obtained from a place Nebula hadn't been able to explore yet. Just by looking at their advancements, the player might be at a similar level as he was. They also might have created an afterlife as well. But this wasn't anything out of his predictions, and there were many ways to deal with the situation. The most important thing at the moment is that he is still on the faster side of meeting all the conditions, and he already made many preparations for war with the players. And now that his afterworld is progressing quickly, he can gladly prepare to welcome this player with open arms. Hit that like button and thanks for watching.